Yeah, hi, sorry. Um, so uh, your money, your privacy is a systematic approach to coin selection um, with uh, Svetlana uh, from uh, University of Innsbruck in, um, in Austria. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Svetlana, University of Innsbruck, and I'd like to talk about coin selection, user privacy, and transaction fees. So before I start, I'd like to give a short motivation for this study. Um, we, um, since the introduction of Bitcoin, uh, we already know that like in the beginning, Bitcoin was often perceived as an anonymous payment network. And here you can see a quote from the Bitcoin Core website. And I think this quote quite nicely summarizes what we know so far about uh, user privacy. And it says that Bitcoin is actually uh, maybe even the most transparent payment network in the world. And at the same time, it can provide some levels of privacy, but only when used correctly. And actually it is responsibility of Bitcoin users to adopt these good practices and to protect their own privacy. And uh, why so? Because uh, we all know that Bitcoin transactions, they are public, the blockchain is public, and each transaction or each coin has its own history. And you can use the blockchain to trace uh, the transaction graph and to basically like go through the transaction history back to the roots. And um, the topic of traceability of Bitcoin transactions, it comes to the paper of uh, Sarah Michael John and others that was published in 2013. And the researchers introduced two heuristics commonly known as multi-input and change address heuristic. And these heuristics have been quite, um, they have been used for de-anonymizing Bitcoin users. And they have been also um, used by all these blockchain forensic companies that we uh, know so far. And when we talk about uh, anonymity and traceability of Bitcoin transactions, it's not only about our anonymity with regards to these private companies, but it's also about our anonymity and user privacy with regards to transaction parties. And uh, when we think about this topic of traceability of Bitcoin transactions, then it comes actually to the question of uh, coin selection or to the issue of coin selection. And that's why we decided to look into this topic. And here you can see the outline of my talk. So I will first talk about coin selection, what it means. Then I will introduce the formal model and I will talk about the solution approach to um, that we have proposed in the paper to actually solve the model and about our results. So what is coin selection? When you go like to a physical uh, shop and you want to pay, for example, for a cup of coffee, you always have to decide, um, you have to make this coin selection decision, which actually means what kind of coins you would like to spend for this particular cup of coffee if you pay by cash. And the same, um, the same decision must be, must be made in the digital world. But in this case, instead of like a physical wallet, we have a cryptocurrency wallet. And in this cryptocurrency wallet, we have different coins or different unspent transaction outputs. And each unspent transaction output, it, it is associated with one specific address. And here I use different colors to actually signal that like, for example, two uh, UTXOs, so they share the same blue color, so they, sh they share the same address. And you may have different uh, UTXOs in your wallet, different coins, and these coins may belong to different addresses. So uh, we can say that coin selection is actually a decision-making process when you select coins in your user wallet in order to satisfy a particular transaction need so that the sum of all coins that you have chosen is greater um, or equal to transaction need plus fees that you pay to, uh, to Bitcoin miners. And uh, this uh, decision, the coin selection decision, it usually, uh, it's not that like Bitcoin users do this uh, decision themselves, but usually it's automated in cryptocurrency wallets and they use different heuristics. And I would like to give you just two examples, the most uh, basic ones, the lowest value first and the highest value first heuristic. 
and you already probably can like um, uh, infer from the names of these heuristics how they work. So if we have, for example, a transaction need and we would like to pay five bitcoins to someone, then in the case of the lowest value first heuristic, we will use these three, like one, two, and four bitcoins. And in the case of highest value first, we'll use just one UTXO, which is worth of six bitcoins. And we can already see uh, from this simple example that in the first case, um, they actually, uh, uh, there is maybe a better solution to pay or to satisfy this transaction need if we use just these two UTXOs that belong to the same address. So they share the same public address. Um, and also in this case, we don't uh, create any additional uh, change output. And in the case of highest value first, uh, we spend six Bitcoins and then we will need to create uh, a change output, which is worth of one Bitcoin. And then if we look like in the future um, uh, perspective, then we may end up with UTXOs, with many UTXOs in our wallet. And all of these UTXOs will have like, um, they will, um, they won't have really uh, high values, but at some point, uh, you will need to combine many different UTXOs in one transaction in order to satisfy transaction amount of higher value. And we can see here that both heuristics, they neglect transaction fees as well as they neglect, neglect user privacy. And if we think about coin selection, then actually it is a um, trade-off. And there are three different, uh, let's say, like objectives um, involved in this uh, problem. On one hand, we have transaction fees, we have financial privacy, but we also have the storage load. Why so? Because Bitcoin users, they're kind of free in aggregating or actually creating as many UTXOs as they would like to. And uh, each UTXO then adds some additional uh, storage load on all Bitcoin users in the network. And here we can see how the Bitcoin uh, UTXO set, the global UTXO has been changing over the time. And here you can see the daily growth rate um, approximated by the first difference of logarithms. And there have been some spikes and downs. For example, in the mid of 2015, there were some stress tests and spam attacks done against uh, the um, network in order to promote for the growth of the block size. As well as we can see that in the beginning of 2018, um, there've been um, uh, some decline in the um, in the size of the Bitcoin set due to low fees, and many people were just combining all the either selling their Bitcoins or combining the UTXOs into UTXOs of higher value. Um, and if you, we look into the literature, then we can see that there are not so many papers on coin selection in general. And there was one seminal paper that was published in 2016 by Mark Erhardt. And he actually looked for the first time into the topic of coin selection. And he analyzed different heuristics that were implemented in some uh, popular wallets. And he analyzed how these heuristics uh, influence on transaction fees as well as on the blockchain size. And there was another recent paper that tries to optimize or model coin selection as an optimization problem between fees and uh, the blockchain size. Then there are also some uh, papers that look into transaction fees and they try to model transaction fees based uh, on some parameters or to propose some mechanisms depending on how long some ETXOs need to be stored in the, on the blockchain. And there is also a stream of research that looks into financial privacy. And uh, also, I think um, we have known already there are many papers that look into anonymity and try to um, come up like, with some heuristics uh, or to evaluate how anonymous different cryptocurrencies are. But we can see here that there is actually a, there was a literature a gap in the literature with regards to these two uh, optimization problems between transaction fees and financial privacy, and both of these objectives we can say that they are individual objectives. So uh, they refer to individual uh, interests of users. 
And we started this coin selection as a trade-off between these transaction fees and financial privacy. And what uh, we try to advocate in our paper is that this uh, question that it requires intertemporal perspective. So we need to look uh, on trans to look at transactions over time because what we decide today it actually counts tomorrow. So what kind of which ETHs also we spend today, we can't spend them anymore uh, in the future, and um, it kind of um, affects our uh, choice of decisions that we can make. And um, first I will introduce the formal model of coin selection and I will start with the terminology. Um, an unspent transaction output we define as a tuple of the form AV. A is just the public address and it identifies the owner of this UTXO and V is just the value. And then we say that a wallet is just a set of addresses and all these addresses, they have a non-zero balance and they're controlled by the same uh, user. And D is the cardinality of this wallet. And we say that the wallet V contains specific UTX, so if the address A is element of this set V. And we um, differentiate between two types of constraints. Um, the first one is combinatorial constraints and combinatorial constraints, they say that any UTXO can be spent only once and it falls from the design of Bitcoin. And we have um, also funding constraints and funding constraints, it um, refers to the transaction amount and says that the sum of all inputs must be known less than the transaction need that we would like to um, uh, pay to someone. And as we can see, combinatorial constraints, they are independent of the values of neither UTXOs nor transaction needs, whereas in contrast, uh, funding constraints, they are dependent on the values of our UTXOs that we have in the wallet um, and also depend on the transaction needs that we would like to satisfy. And um, then we define a notion of an elementary choice and elementary choice is just a mapping of all UTXOs that you have in the wallet to a ternary set T1, T2 or nothing. And um, T1, T2 and nothing. So we have, we, um, our model um, consists of two um, periods, two transactions and each UTXO, it can be spent either in the first transaction or in the second transaction or UTXO may be not spent at all. And then uh, we also say that when you do the first transaction, then you may also create a change output and this change output then can be spent in the next transaction. So in the second transaction, or uh, we can also, um, there is maybe no need to spend it at all. And if we have a wallet of size M, so um, we say that the wallet is of size M if it has M UTXOs, then we can um, define the total number of elementary choices. We can just write this Q um, combinatorically and uh, you can see the formula here. So the key idea or the key point is that for each uh, size wallet of M, there is uh, a number or a specific, yeah, we can identify the total number of all possible elementary choices. And sometimes some, we may have a situation when we may have several elementary choices feasible, yeah, or possible. So we may have several options to satisfy or to spend in both transactions. And for this, we use the notion of a choice profile. So a choice profile P is just a binary vector and this vector has the length of Q and each element of this vector just indicates whether this elementary choice is feasible or not under this set of finding constraints. Now I'd like to give you a short example in order to illustrate uh, all this, um, yeah, this terminology and terms. So we have a wallet V with just two UTXOs, A1, uh, uh, V1 and AT, V2. V2. And uh, we say that first, like in the first transaction or in the first period, we may spend the first uh, UTXO A1, V1, the second, or we may spend both of them. And then we have the second transaction and um, yes, and also we have to take into account the funding constraints. And here you can see on the edges all these funding constraints. 
and one is uh, the transaction need that we would like to uh, satisfy in the first transaction. And then in the second transaction for each of the um, choice that we made in the first transaction, we may have um, different options. For example, if we spent in the first transaction, the first UTXO, then in the second transaction, we have basically three choices. We either spend the next, uh, the second UTXO, we may spend the change, which is denoted by H here, or we may spend both of them. Yeah, the second UTXO as well as the change output. And uh, each of these like path, it actually uh, represents one elementary choice that we may have in this model. And then we define um, the funding constraints for uh, the second transaction, saying that the uh, second transaction need uh, must be no less than the uh, choice that we make in this transaction. And then we can define this vector P or a profile choice. And for example, here we say, that, for example, the first elementary choice is not feasible because the second transaction need um, is greater than um, V2, than the value of the second uh, UTXO. And um, this choice profile, we then said that it's active if the following condition holds. So we just take all the funding constraints and for each uh, zero bit, we take the um, a negation of these two funding constraints for the first and the second uh, period. And for the whole choice profile, we, we take the conjunction of all these uh, constraints that we have for this particular choice profile. And um, the model, uh, yes, and then we use uh, satisfiability module theory, SMT solver, to check whether these constraints or the system of constraints is actually satisfiable, satisfiable in the symbolic parameter space. And the whole idea behind our approach was that we would like to get a general solution to a problem and not to find just like solution to some numerical instances of this problem. And we can see that this problem is actually an incomplete um, problem and it's a variant of subset sum problem which is hard to solve and uh, it um, <laughs> adds some complexity to our problem or to our model as well. So the model itself, it looks like this. So we identify or we um, have S um, I, which actually set a few jigsaws that we select in each um, period. Then we have A Y, it's a set of addresses that associated with this selection that we made. And we also introduce parameter lambda to actually um, model the preference of user for privacy over transaction fees. And then we differentiate between uh, two different models or between two types of uh, Bitcoin users, uh, myopic and strategic. And um, on the timeline, the decision looks like this. We have our wallet, then the user, it learns its first transaction need N1, makes a coin selection decision S1, then learns the second transaction need N2 and makes the second uh, coin selection decision. And myopic user or myopic optimization, it means that the user optimizes just for one transaction and it optimizes just for transaction fees. Um, and transaction fees, we take the simplest form, uh, we model transaction fees as just the cardinality of this set uh, as E. So basically how many UTXOs um, the user has selected for this transaction. And we then differentiate between strategic optimization and for strategic optimization, we take the whole timeline into account. So we take both transactions and our optimization function now consists of two parts. So the first part is actually the optimization for transaction fees. So we just take all our UTXOs that we have chosen in the first and in the second transaction. And the second component of the optimization function refers to the um, privacy. And we say that the privacy is violated if both of these transactions are linked to each other and they can be linked um, due to these two heuristics. Either um, both of these uh, set of addresses that we have chosen in the first or either in the second uh, transaction, they share the same address or we choose uh, the change output in the second transaction. And that's why we also link both transactions um, due to this choice. 
and then we introduced this uh, chronica delta, which is just a penalty uh, that we impose in the optimization function due to this linkability that we introduced uh, with our coin selection decisions. And we have um, proposed the following solution approach to solve this problem. And uh, our um, approach consists of two parts. We have the exhaustive search part and the evaluation. And in the exhaustive search part, we basically solve the combinatorial problem. And in the evaluation, we then actually um, see for each possible solution whether we violate the privacy of users. So the exhaustive search, basically what we do, we have our uh, wallet of size M with M UTXOs. We generate all possible choices and all possible constraints. We then generate choice profiles and then we check whether this profile is satisfiable uh, in the, um, by using the um, capabilities of SMT solver. And uh, then for uh, each satisfiable profile, we basically calculate with the cost function and we calculate this cost function for each possible configuration of the wallet. Um, configuration of a wallet, we define it as like um, the HXOs that you have in the wallet, they may have different assignments to addresses and we just take all possible assignments of these HXOs to addresses and then we calculate the cost function for each of these uh, possible options. And then we uh, check uh, in which cases um, the privacy is violated or is not violated and in which cases the user pays high transaction fees and so on. And you can see uh, um, here how this um, problem in general scales. It's a hard problem and you can see that like if you have only two UTXOs in the wallet then we have 127 choice profiles and if we just add additional UTXO to the wallet then we have already over 2 billion choice profiles possible and by running SMT we managed to reduce these numbers uh, for two UTXOs to 11 active choice profiles and for three to 93 active choice profiles. And um, here you can see all the possible configurations of wallets for the case of three UTXOs. So we have three UTXOs with values V1, V2, and V3 in this um, ascending order. And uh, in the first configuration, all these UTXOs, they uh, belong or they are associated with different addresses. Whereas in the last, um, configuration they belong to the same address and we then have three intermediate options where um, two UTXOs share the same address depending on which uh, value they have. And then we um, calculated the cost function for each of these possible configuration and for all choice profiles or active choice profiles that we have identified. And here I would like to show you the results for um, two heuristics that we have evaluated with this approach, the lowest and highest value first. And if we do strategic optimization for transaction fees, then we can see that in 84%, uh, uh, the heuristic, the lowest, lowest value first heuristic um, leads to um, suboptimal results. So the user pays higher fees than optimal. And if we can see the strategic optimization for privacy, then here you can also see the statistics in how many cases uh, the lowest value first is worse than optimizing just for privacy and in how many cases the highest value first heuristics is um, worse um, as well. And you can see here that in general, yeah, and I think it's already also expected outcome that the highest value first is better if we compare both heuristics against each other. So um, in summary, um, this paper, we formally reason on coin selection and we introduce this intertemporal view on privacy. Um, and we would like to advocate the use of SMT solver, how to find this general solution to the problem and to uh, derive some recommendations for better design of wallets, how, for example, to provide users with opportunity to decide themselves whether they would like to optimize for privacy or for transaction fees. 
But of course, there are uh, some limitations that come from our approach as well as from the assumptions that we have made. First of all, our model rests on the assumption, very strong assumption that we have complete information about transaction needs, which is really hard to actually see, I think, in practice. So we assume that both transaction needs in the first and second um, transaction is already known um, to, to the user. Then we use simplistic cost function and um, especially how we actually model privacy in the way that we say that privacy is violated is with if um, both transactions are linked to each other. We also use complex algorithm or I mean this algorithm is very computationally expensive and it can't be used in practice and we assume or we think that there is actually a better search strategy that could optimize the whole like uh, exhaustive search approach that we have chosen for this paper. And in the end, I would like to use also this opportunity to make some advertisement. And right now, together with our colleagues from the University of British Columbia, we are running a survey of users and knowledgeable non-users uh, with regards to security risk and protection of crypto assets. And this survey went online just last week. And it takes approximately 20 minutes and you can also have a chance to win Amazon gift card. And I would like to um, ask you to fill out this survey if you have some background knowledge about cryptocurrencies. And please also uh, feel free to share this link with your community members and we will be really glad and helpful. We'll be really uh, grateful if you can help us with this survey. So. Thank you. And uh, if you have questions, I would love to uh, hear them. Yeah, does this uh, work? Uh, cool. Thank you. Great paper and talk. In the beginning of your talk, uh, you introduced the trade off space. Like there, there was a triangle between storage, low transaction fees, and financial privacy. And it was yeah. interesting to see that there was not any single paper which considered all three of these um, dimensions of the trade off space. And can you give us um, an insight why you didn't consider storage load in your utility function? And um, yeah, uh, why? why you didn't consider this? Is it even more computationally intractable or? Yeah. Yes, yes, it's a really good question. And I think in general, coin selection is a really, really hard problem. And that's why um, there is no literature or no papers so far that looks into all three different objectives or trade-offs that you have in coin selection. And um, right now, we. I mean, coin selection is actually not done uh, by users, but usually yeah, it's automated in a cryptocurrency wallets. And most of these wallets, they just focus on one particular uh, corner of this triangle and it's the storage load or the blockchain size. So cryptocurrency wallets or the implementations that we have at the moment, they try to optimize for the storage load or for the um, site of the UTXO set. And um, yeah, I mean, it's um, NP complete problem and it's, um, it's not that like we can have really um, ready solution how to tackle this problem. And I think that's the reason why we don't have any paper or why in general we have so few papers that try to tackle this problem. Thank you. Hi, uh, great talk. I'm wondering if um, if you go with sort of highest value first, is there a tendency for dust outputs to be produced? Because it seems like you're sort of breaking up the outputs so they get smaller and smaller. And then at some point, you know, the fee would be more than the, the output is worth to move it. And then you sort of lose the whole output in a sense. Yes, um, I mean, uh, this uh, lowest value first as well as the highest value first, they are not optimal and they will produce uh, some dust outputs uh, if you like take a longer time horizon into account. And I think it's like, um, yeah, both of these heuristics, they're the most uh, basic ones. And we have seen that also in case of, um, yeah, of our optimization or our model 
the highest value first performs better than the lowest value first. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. It was really informative. Uh, I was wondering, kind of piggybacking off of that last one, um, if it does eventually tend to go towards more and more transactions um, in order to decrease the link between the previous transactions, is there a way to continue that um, forward or is there eventually going to be half, there has to be some sort of solution that will relink all of those transactions at some point, right? Do you understand what I'm, does that make sense? Um, I think I didn't get quite the question. Um, I'm just wondering if there's been research into, or if my assumption is incorrect, um, as far as when you keep creating more and more transactions in order to delink previous ones in order to improve uh, privacy, um, mm -hmm. at some point you'll probably have to relink them just because the outputs are going to be smaller and smaller. Um, has there been research into how to continue preserving privacy in that scenario? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think like. Um, in general, um, yeah, as I said on the very like, first slide, um, it's users' responsibility yet yeah, to protect their privacy. And of course, you can make some, uh, you can undertake some approaches how to make this transaction linkability to avoid this linkability of transactions. And I think also Bitcoin. I, in general, like our model is quite simplified and maybe it doesn't cover particularly this case when you just um, try to combine many different inputs and you have also many different outputs within one transaction. What kind of assumption we do in our model is that each transaction, it may have multiple inputs, but it will have only just two outputs, the transaction or mm. the transaction need itself and the change output. But of course, you may also, as a Bitcoin user, you may try to create such transactions that you have multiple inputs and you have multiple outputs in order to hide these links, the other links between inputs and outputs and make it more difficult to external observer to actually trace the transaction graph. And um, this is also what I think, yeah, like these approaches like coin chain transactions, so on, they try to, um, to implement or to add some additional inputs uh, or add some additional outputs to transactions so that it's harder to find these links between um, inputs and outputs within one transaction. But our model is quite simplistic in this way, and it doesn't actually focus on these kind of transactions. And um, yeah, I mean, there is um, there are some approaches so like uh, mixing and uh, conjoint transactions that try to um, provide or to provide more privacy to users. Great, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think that's all the questions we have here. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you.